There are many developers, producers, and creators who help make the video game industry what it is today. When it comes to Nintendo, Shigeru Miyamoto is the first name that many would think of. His legacy is well documented and nothing short of amazing. But I started noticing another name. A name I would repeatedly see on game credits, but never really knew much more. He just kept popping up. After researching his work, I was amazed that he was responsible for some of Nintendo's most iconic stories and designs. This is the story of Nintendo's Takashi Tezuka. Takashi Tezuka was born November 17, 1960 in Osaka City, Japan. He graduated from the design department of Osaka University of Arts in the early 1980s and was introduced to Nintendo by a friend who was applying to the company. Although his friend wasn't hired on, Tezuka received an internship from Nintendo in 1983. His first assignment was assisting part-time with the graphics on the upcoming arcade sequel, Super Punch-Out. This would also be Tezuka's first meeting with Shigeru Miyamoto, one of the artists assigned to the project. With new characters Super Macho Man, Beer Hugger, Vodka Drakinsky, and Dragon Chan, Nintendo had their sequel ready for the arcades. Super Punch-Out! was released in Japan in September of 1984. Following Super Punch-Out!, Tezuka was hired on full-time at Nintendo, who had just released the Family Computer, or Famicom. ファミリーコンピュータの楽しいカセット情報。シングルス、ダブルスの本格テニスをコンピュータと技比べ。5段階のランクが楽しめます。ピンボール。迫力のフリッパー、スロットマシンのスリル。ポーカーゲームの興
When the game was finally finished, Tezuka's credits would include designer and assistant director. Super Mario Bros. was released on September 13, 1985 in Japan and was a huge success for Nintendo. However, there was another game that still needed to be completed. Throughout the production of Super Mario Bros., Miyamoto and Tezuka were also working on The Legend of Zelda for the upcoming Famicom Disk System. Development ideas were separated by Miyamoto. Linear concepts would be used for Mario, and the nonlinear ideas for Zelda. While Mario used a side-scrolling format, Zelda would be a top-down view, allowing players to carefully examine each screen. Inspired by Miyamoto's exploration of forests and caves as a child, Zelda was more about the journey and navigating through an unknown world, not just completing a level. Tezuka, a fan of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, would be tasked with writing the script for the game. The story of a brave hero named Link, who must retrieve the eight fragments of the Triforce of Wisdom in order to save Princess Zelda from the clutches of Ganon. The Legend of Zelda had a complete open world, maze-like dungeons that could be completed out of order and secrets on nearly every other screen. Certain items were needed to progress throughout the game and the player could upgrade their sword by finding new swords hidden within the overworld. Instead of rushing through a level, the player had to really think about what they should do next. By the end of production, Tezuka, also known as Tintin, was credited as co-director, designer, and writer for The Legend of Zelda. The game was released February 21st, 1986 as a launch title for the Famicom Disk System. Within Tezuka's first three years at Nintendo, he had helped launch Super Mario Bros. and The Legend of Zelda. Super Mario Bros. would go on to sell more than 40 million copies, and Nintendo needed a sequel. Takashi Tezuka would be assigned as director for the project. Nintendo had introduced an arcade machine focusing on two-player cooperative gameplay known as the Nintendo Versa system. Super Mario Bros. had already been ported over to the arcade machines, however, the game was much more difficult. Platforms and landings were even smaller, there were more enemies and even less power-ups. Tezuka felt that players had mastered the original game and they needed a sequel that would really challenge them. He worked with Miyamoto and the rest of the team to develop a sequel based on the same concept as the Versus Arcade game. In fact, many levels from this arcade game made it into Super Mario Bros. 2. The majority of the gameplay and visuals are identical to the first game, excluding the two-player option. This time the player would select either Mario or Luigi, who each had their own unique set of abilities. Luigi was designed to be more for skilled players, as he could jump higher, but he had less ground friction when he landed. Mario, on the other hand, is a bit faster, more balanced and familiar. The game also introduced a few new items and mechanics, such as poison mushrooms, warp pipes that would send the player to previous levels, and even mid-air wind gusts. Tezuka and the team at Nintendo set out to make a Mario game that would really challenge players, and they succeeded. Super Mario Bros. 2 is known for its extreme difficulty, so much so that Nintendo of America declined to release the game to the North American market. The US got something a little different. A Mario-infused revision of the Japanese game, Yume Kojo Doki Doki Panic. With Tezuka's directorial debut complete, Super Mario Bros. 2 was released in Japan on June 3, 1986, just nine months after the release of Super Mario Bros. It would go on to become the best-selling game for the Famicom Disk System, selling over 2.5 million copies. Shortly after the release of Super Mario Bros. 2, production began for Super Mario Bros. 3. With Miyamoto as the game's producer, Tezuka would again assume the role of director and main artist. The team had a few goals in mind when development began. More gaming systems were starting to enter the market in Japan, and Nintendo was secretly putting the finishing touches on its next console. However, the Famicom was still a huge success. They wanted to make the greatest 8-bit game possible before the technology became obsolete. The team wanted the game to have a complete redesign with new visuals and challenges. Luckily, technology was on their side. ROM cartridge prices were finally starting to fall and their memory size was exceeding what the Famicom disk could hold. Other advancements in memory chips such as the MMC3 chip would allow the team to split the screen, animate tiles, and enhance the power of the Famicom system. Aided by technological advances, Miyamoto had Tezuka start working on the game without any restrictions or interferences. 
Tezuka and the team started experimenting with an idea that the game could be played from an isometric point of view. Unfortunately, it proved too difficult to position jumps, and the team went back to the 2D side-scrolling view from the previous games. However, you can still see part of this design from the title screen's checkered floor. Tezuka also designed a Mario hat with cute little ears and a tail that would eventually become Raccoon Mario. For the first time, the game would be navigated through an overworld map, and unlike the previous games, each level really felt like its own unique world. There's still blue skies and water levels, but there's also deserts, ice worlds, islands, ships, and gigantic turtles. Mario would be completely redesigned as well and can now slide down slopes, freely climb vines, and even throw blocks and Koopa shells. With the Super Leaf, Tanuki, Frog, and Hammer Suit added, Mario had more power-ups than ever before. There are many new enemies that also appear in the game, such as Booze, an enemy inspired by Tezuka's wife. Although normally shy, she exploded on Tezuka one day for spending too much time at his job, and the Boo was born. Bowser would also be redesigned, and for the first time we were introduced to the Koopalings, who served as bosses at the end of each level. With over two years in development, the game would become one of Tezuka's favorites in the Mario series. He's quoted as saying, For me, the most memorable moment and title is actually Super Mario 3. I had to draw, create the concept, and direct. It was really challenging for me. It took a lot longer than I expected, and I needed a lot of help from the team. It was really a team effort, and for me, a very memorable project. Super Mario Bros. 3 was released in Japan on October 23, 1988. It would become the second best-selling Famicom game of all time. The U.S. market would have to wait a bit longer, however. The American version of Super Mario Bros. 2 was still in development and wouldn't hit shells until the end of 1988. There was also a massive ROM chip shortage at this time, which would delay the release of several games. Due to this, America wouldn't receive Super Mario Bros. 3 until February of 1990. It didn't matter. In the United States, Super Mario Bros. 3 sold 250,000 copies within its first two days. If you converted the total sales of the game to today's dollar, Super Mario Bros. 3 garnered over $1.9 billion. For Takashi Tezuka, his first four years at Nintendo were quite a journey. Starting out as a new employee who had never heard of Pac-Man, he would go on to direct, write, design, and even draw the majority of pixel art himself. Nintendo had reignited the video game market across the world, but Tezuka's career at Nintendo was just starting. 